this afternoon's event and speaker. My name is Dr. Marian Lewis Casado, as many of you know, and I direct the French and Francophone uh, Studies Program and co-direct the Global Studies Institute and the Palmer Global Scholars Program here at Ohio Wesleyan University. So I have both organizations and, and individuals to thank before we get started. First, I want to acknowledge funds from the Great Lakes Colleges Association, the GLCA, that make this event possible. Second, I want to recognize the organizational efforts made by my colleague and friend, our OWU GLCA liaison and associate professor of English, Dr. Nancy Comerau. Third, I want to thank my friend, neighbor, colleague, and co-director, Dr. Nathan Amador Rowley. Um, and of course, the Global, the Global Scholars intern, Brittany Stiltner. Finally, I want to recognize Tom and Susan Palmer, who endowed the Palmer Global, Global Scholars Program and who are here with us wow. this afternoon. So thank you so much. Without further ado, I'll introduce to you this afternoon's speaker, former Ambassador Gina Winston Lee. She is the first woman diplomat to lead a U.S. consulate in Saudi Arabia and she's the former U.S. Ambassador to Malta. She is also a native of Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Ambassador Winston Lee has been an influential figure in U.S. foreign policy throughout her 30-year career in international diplomacy. Among her many senior roles in world affairs, she was the longest serving U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Malta from 2012 to 2016. In another role as the Special Assistant for the Middle East and North Africa, she monitored the election in the Gaza Strip and supported gender equality as the first woman to lead a diplomatic mission in Saudi Arabia. Ambassador Winston Lee also expanded the U.S. government's counterterrorism partners and programs as Deputy Coordinator for Counterterrorism from 2008 to 2012. She has held senior positions at the Defense Department and the National Security Council of the White House. Her work in diplomacy has garnered Winston Lee many notable accolades, including the Maltese Order of Merit and Department of State Meritorious and Superior Honor Awards. Uh, Ambassador Winston Lee now resides in Cleveland, where she's a consultant and public speaker. Finally, I want to mention that 20 very lucky OWU students will meet with Ambassador Winston Lee tomorrow in small group sessions that focus on career mentorship and advising. So, uh, albeit virtually, please join me in welcoming former Ambassador Winston Lee and in acknowledging all those who made today's and tomorrow's events with her possible. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness. This is so weird. I look forward to meeting you all in person. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to say to you all so that you have no doubt at all, my motivation is recruiting. We need each and every one of you to think very seriously about a career in diplomacy. It's waiting for you. We need you. So I want you to know that going in. Um, as you heard, I am originally from Cleveland, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Uh, I didn't have any international travel in my family before I became a diplomat, although my siblings, two older and one younger, all joined the military at one point. My older brother was drafted, but the other two joined voluntarily. So they traveled overseas but with the military so i'm the first diplomat in the family i uh, did a foreign language in high school and then went to george washington university for college and did my sophomore year abroad using the language that i learned in high school so that was my first overseas experience i imagine some of you have already done a semester or so abroad and when we get into the q a period i look forward to, to hearing about that as well uh, but it certainly whetted my appetite for the Middle East, for the issues that were there, um, the need for diplomacy to help resolve those issues, and of course, the excitement, the adventure of traveling overseas. So that first trip got me hooked. Uh, finished out my degree and did two years as a Peace Corps volunteer, which I would love to talk to many of you about as well. 
whether it's today or in our smaller sessions tomorrow. Um, I did my Peace Corps in the Persian Gulf, the Sultanate of Oman. We'll wait and see if they're the next country to make peace with Israel, uh, where I worked for the Ministry of Health for two years. And then I came back and did my master's degree at Johns Hopkins University. And with that, I brought the Arabic that I learned as a Peace Corps volunteer back and did Arabic as a graduate student and got ready for looking for a job. And all of you, whether it's after your bachelor's or after a longer period of time, you will too be looking for a job. I'm going to say something that um, college uh, instructors, faculties, etc., don't like to hear. So madam, you may want to put your fingers in your ears for this next sentence, but you all should know to become a U.S. diplomat, you do not need a college degree. The most successful, and by successful, I mean he moved the fastest up the ranks in the class that I came in with, only had a high school degree. But what he did was educate himself in an experiential fashion. After high school, he packed up, put out his thumb, saved the money, and worked his way around the world, spent most of his time in Asia, learning Japanese and Chinese fluently, and learning about uh, the culture and then studying up on US diplomatic history and he was able to pass the test. So to become a US diplomat, all you have to do is take the test and pass the test. And we can talk about what that entails in the Q&A period. So know that. Now, the easier way to do it, frankly, is to get a college degree. So I will admit that and that's certainly what I chose to do, both that bachelor's and a master's degree. Most people come into the US diplomatic corps with a master's degree, but again, many don't because they just pass the test. I need you to know that there are the State Department, of course, but there is also the Agency for International Development for those of you who are interested in development work with resolving food security, agricultural work, infrastructure work, education, those things are handled by AID. But there's also the Foreign Agricultural Service. For those who have an interest in um, partnering with countries around the world to help them better produce their own food or selling U.S. wheat around the world, which we do, um, experimentations with seeds and other scientific discoveries. The Foreign Agricultural Service oversees that and has a whole cadre of diplomats around the world who focus on agriculture. And we have the Foreign Commercial Service, which is a cadre of diplomats who are advocating for U.S. business, whether it's for supplying, um, engines, GE engines, selling cars, being partners in infrastructure projects in countries, um, making connections for foreign countries who want to sell to the United States and often need a U.S. partner to find the best way into markets. But there's a whole series of diplomats who do that. So if you have a business, an entrepreneurial spirit, and want to focus on that sort of thing, you too can do that. The point I'm telling you about all this is that just about any degree that you study, and my, my urging to you is to study whatever you want to, but do well in it, do well. You can bring it to the US Diplomatic Corps and find a way to feed your soul with what you love to do, as well as represent the United States around the world. So I wanna put that down there. So I'm going to talk you through my career, which I believe is a very typical one. Uh, my philosophy may not be as typical as some, but it has worked very well for me, and I think it can work for you too. And it is this. Nobody wants to work with the pruny face. Where, again, whatever you do, make sure you're enjoying it. And if you are enjoying it, you're going to do well. And if you do well, people will want to work with you, They'll want you to work for them and they'll want to work for you. So try and find that thing, whatever it is that you enjoy. And I chose my assignments based on whether they seemed interesting, adventurous to me. Was I going to enjoy the experience or the issues that I was going to be responsible for? 
and therefore do a good job. And with that philosophy, I had a lot of fun as I rose up the ranks traveling the world. And every day wasn't great, don't get me wrong. But overall, it was an exciting, fulfilling, fun career. And I think those things are important. So my first assignment was London, uh, which upset me a great deal because I thought I should be old and then I'd want to go someplace like London or Paris. It's not too difficult, very comfortable, good food, good housing. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm young and energetic and I can rough it a little bit more than London. I, I joke, I'm looking around to make sure my husband isn't around because I also joke, my husband's English and my mother-in-law was there and I really did not want to be in London, but tell no one. So after they assigned me to London, I had the Arabic already, I tested out and I went to our Near Eastern Bureau and introduced myself. People said, let people know who you are. One of the things that's so important in your career, whatever you're doing, is the ability to advocate for yourself, to speak up about what you know you do well, what you bring to the table, why people should want you on their team. So I walked around and introduced myself to all the different offices. And there was like the Egypt office and the North Africa office and the Levant office and so on and so forth. And I got to the Iraq desk and introduced myself. And I'm sure the guy behind the desk thought, hmm, there's a live one. So a couple of days later, after I'd gone in, I got an email and, uh, and it, maybe it was a phone call at that point. But anyway, they just asked, would you be interested in going to Baghdad? And I said, well, I think so, but let me check home. Another thing about the diplomatic corps, the divorce, the divorce rate is two thirds, which is very high, higher than the national average. One of the ways that I've kept my marriage together is making no decisions without speaking about it at home first. Now, I, I may be clear about what I want to do, I may have some work to do to convince him, but I go home first. So I went home and said Baghdad to my husband. We've been married three years by then. And he said, sure, why not? So I told them, sure, why not? I'll go to Baghdad. And uh, they said, great. <laughs> You've got to go to London first for the summer because every diplomat does at least one assignment doing consular work. Diplomacy is a very rich, that's why I say you can study anything and bring it to the table and be a successful diplomat. The thing that most foreigners see with American diplomats is who is a person that gave them their tourist visa. That's what most foreigners see. And if you don't give them a visa, you have to remember that you may be the only American they meet. So it's so important to treat them with respect and and humility for the power that you have over their lives because you're at least spoiling their vacation if that's all they want to do. But if they did have other plans of immigrating or staying longer, you are changing their lives from their perspective, not for the good. And so being kind is really important, whatever you do. So he said, great for Baghdad. I spent three months in London working the consular line, the visa line, uh, which was People were lined up around the embassy block waiting to get into the embassy to issue visas. And we did it nine to six every day. It was, it was a visa mill is what the term was. And then at the end of August, I said bye-bye to London and went off to Baghdad. During that time, there was a war between Iran and Iraq. It was called the Gulf War at the time, but it is now known as the Iraq-Iran War. And it was also known as the War of the Cities. Well, this is where the bombs come in because the Iranians and the Iraqis were sending Scud missiles at each other's capital city. The thing about Scud missiles is that they can cause a lot of damage when they fall. Usually people are killed by, you know, immediate vicinity and then the percussion, which sends flying glass everywhere and can slice and dice you. But they're not very accurate. So they launch them and they have no idea where in the city they're going to fall. And the Iraqis were sending them to Tehran and the Iranians were sending them to Baghdad. At the time, even though missiles were hitting Baghdad, we did not get danger pay because the Department of State said, well, they're not aimed at Americans. You just might be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that 
it's not aimed at Americans. So we don't consider you to be specifically in danger. Just, they've improved since then, but at the time, no extra pay for being in a war zone. Um, a year and a half in Baghdad, doing consular work. I ran the section and that was the joy of leaving London where I was visa officer number 18 out of 18 and going to Baghdad where I was the head of the section. So I got my first managerial skills immediately. I had two amazing local staff to give the visas, to do the research, to do all the, the um, technical work of getting it set up in passports, etc. cetera. And um, I will tell you, if you join the diplomatic corps, that probably your best stories will come from your visa work. Everybody hates to do it because you're meeting desperate people on a daily basis and most often you're saying no to them, which is not fun, but be kind. Um, I got my first bribe while I was in Baghdad. It was only $62,000. Um, even then I knew it wasn't enough. And I said to the gentleman, you know, thank you, for thinking of me, but if I'm going to lose my reputation, if I am going to chance going to prison, it really has to have many more zeros behind it before it's going to be of interest. And he laughed and I laughed, but it's just one of those things that can happen to you on the visa line. Um, again, I, and I, I will, one more story. I gave a visa to a really nice gentleman who said he was going for uh, tourism. And I feel certain that I was swayed because he had a really nice voice and a really nice accent. I must have been feeling very nice that day. Because although I was like, mm, I said, let me take a chance. Every now and again, you say, let me take a chance and you give the visa. But when anyone comes to the United States, a lot of people do not realize the visa gets you to the point, the port of entry, it gets you to the airport in Chicago or New York or Cleveland or wherever the international airport is. But then you've got to go through customs and immigration. And they have the ability to open your luggage and to ask you questions and check all kinds of things. As you know, your phone at this point they can check. But this is back in the late 80s, so no phones. But they did open this guy's luggage and it turned out in his luggage he had a letter of uh, invitation for a job work in the United States and he had all his welding equipment in his luggage. So in fact, he lied to me. He was actually going to work and he was only supposed to be going for two weeks. And whenever somebody comes to the port of entry and immigration stops them and sends them back because you gave a visa when you shouldn't have, they send you a letter to tell you that you made a mistake. They're called blue slips. You don't want to see them, but sometimes you will because everybody makes a mistake. I didn't get many, but I did get a few, and I remember that guy. So in Baghdad, I was the consular chief, and I was the human rights officer. There are many little answer, ancillary things that you have to do as a diplomat. So giving visas is an important one. Taking care of American citizens. Whenever Americans retire overseas, they'll come into the embassy to get their retirement check, their treasury check. Um, they might come into the embassy to get their mail. Um, if they get thrown in jail for whatever reason, they're going to contact the embassy. You, as a U.S. diplomat, will go and visit them in prison. I got to make a visit to Her Majesty's Prison Bristol while I was in London and check on how they're being treated, check on whether they need any medical attention, do they need a reference for a lawyer. You don't make any recommendations for a lawyer because you can't do that, but you'll give them a list. These are at least lawyers that have licenses to practice in this jurisdiction. You don't recommend them to, to them. Um, you might take letters to and fro from them to send to their families or arrange family visits. And so we would, depending on the country, in England, we visited prisoners once every three months. And other countries where the situation might be more tenuous, we would visit more often. So you're gonna be doing prison visits. Um, from London to Baghdad, we had, in Baghdad, we had an American citizen who was in prison. He was in prison for uh, corruption. I think he tried to bribe an Iraqi official, but he was being tortured in prison. And they pulled out all of his fingernails and they um, did what you, uh, they, 
they attached him to a rotating ceiling fan and beat the soles of his feet with a rubber hose. And they did that because it's incredibly painful and it doesn't leave marks on the body. So if you're just seeing them through a screen, they look all right to you. It's not till you actually get to have a conversation. So a lot of my responsibility during that period was negotiating with the Iraqis to get him out of prison and back to the United States, which I was able to do. Um, I also negotiated a consular treaty. Again, this was my very first assignment. I was a very raw new diplomat. And yet I was negotiating treaties. I did a, a consular um, treaty with the Iraqi government on the length of visas. So one of the things that makes this work so enjoyable from the very beginning, depending on where in the world you are, you get the ability to use your language immediately and get really good at it. Um, you get the ability to have an impact on people's lives from the first day that you step into the consular section, you are having an impact on somebody else's life and somebody else's future, hopefully for the good. You might be, as I did, negotiating a consular treaty. You're visiting people in prison. You might be negotiating to get them out of prison. So all of these things, if there's any accidents in your country, if a ship comes in or a plane crashes or anything like that, as a consular officer, you are the one who's going to be sent out to gather information, to put things in place, to help, to get people home again. When I was in Washington, at one point in my career, I ran a task force, but the consular officers, this is in 2006 when the Israelis and Hezbollah in Lebanon were at war. Well, we evacuated 15,000 Americans out of that war zone. It was the largest evacuation of American citizens since World War II since World War II. And you can imagine the desperate American family, you know, calling the U.S. Embassy, calling the State Department, trying to find their loved ones or letting us know their loved ones trapped here or stuck there and please go help them, please go get them. If anyone ever tells you when you're abroad, if you're going to be abroad for longer than a week in a country, I want you to go register with the U.S. Embassy. Let them know where you are and tell your friends and family to do so. Because we had on our books that we had about 8,000 American citizens in Lebanon, in the Beirut area. And it turned out there were 15,000 because the other 7,000 hadn't registered, which made our ability to help them so much harder. So I leave that with you as well. So doing the human rights report in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, as you can imagine, was a little bit difficult. The Mukhabarat, I don't know if any of you speak Arabic, but that is the Arabic word for internal police, secret police, whatever you want to call them. They're in many countries. Um, kept a very tight reign over Iraqi citizens, even our own staff had to report to them once a week on what they had overheard within the embassy. So that meant as an American diplomat, we also had a greater responsibility not to compromise our local staff, to be discreet, not to make mistakes and share information that would make them have a, a, a pull about whether they should share it, who were they betraying, their own country or us. So we really worked hard not to put them in that kind of situation. So that was Iraq. From there, I went on to Indonesia. Um, there, I was again the human rights officer, and I was responsible for Irian Jaya a province, and I was responsible for Muslim organizations. If any of you have seen the movie The Year of Living Dangerously, you know that the last major change of government uh, for 20 years from Suhar uh, Sukarno to Suharto uh, was led by students. So the U.S. government kept a very close eye on what people like you in Indonesia were thinking? What were they thinking about the government? How were they feeling about the level of corruption, about their ability to get a job? Could they get married? Could they find housing? What was the poverty situation? Were they angry? Were they frustrated? We, we kept a close eye and we reported on because we were aware that students coalescing could change a government as they had in 1968. So, I was responsible for them and I was responsible for Muslim organizations. Indonesia, many Americans don't realize, is the largest Muslim country in the world. It's got the largest population in the world. It is known as a moderate 
country insofar as local culture, Islam is on top of the local culture. So um, it doesn't look like the Middle East as far as how Islam is practiced, generally speaking, among the population. But Nablatul Ulama and uh, Muhammadiyah were the names of the two Muslim organizations, and I would meet with their leaders and talk about, you know, whether uh, they felt that they were being respected by the government, how was education, all those sorts of questions as you are, because I was a political officer, so monitoring the state of the government, monitoring the political situation in the country. The um, head of Muhammadiyah at the time, and I was, you know, a second tour officer, you know, still in my 20s, um, new, new, new. And the head of the uh, organization was Abdurrahman al Wahid, was his name. He was mostly blind. Um, I guess at that time he was probably in his early 40s, but someone that I would go and talk to about the political situation. He was very um, charming, incredibly well read. Um, uh, I think he may have studied either in Holland or the UK, but you know his English was very good. I had studied Indonesian. The State Department will train you in 26 separate languages. So even if you don't come in with the language you need, we will train you in it. Don't worry. Um, so I took six months of Indonesian to get my language up so that I could do my meetings in Indonesian. But you know he was he was someone I really enjoyed speaking with. I would host events in my home because socializing is part of the job. So even if you're a first tour officer, you get a representation allowance. You get money from the U.S. government that will allow you to take people out for coffee, that will allow you to host them at lunch or dinner, because we know, we all know, information flows. People get comfortable. Friendships are born that are very, very useful just for your own psyche and also for the U.S. government because you're making good contacts. So the government will help you do that entertaining. And uh, so he used to drink scotch in my house when he came to my dinner parties. He, he liked good scotch and I don't like it, but I kept it in my house for my guests. Now, as you may know, um, he later on became the president of Indonesia. And I was like, oh my gosh, my friend is now <laughs> president of a huge and important country. So you'll meet those connections as a young officer, but they can stand you in excellent stead as you move up the ranks. And so for people who are Asia hands, for instance, so if that was my area where I decided to specialize, then I probably, when he became president, they might've sent me back to Indonesia because that would be a good posting. I would have a good connection with the head of the government and hopefully be able to support really good bilateral relations between the U.S. and Indonesia. Asia was not my place, though. My place was the Middle East because I'd had those wonderful experiences as a student and as a Peace Corps volunteer and had the language and a deep knowledge and affection for the culture. So that, that became my place. So from Indonesia, I went to Egypt, which if I'm, if I'm not speaking to somebody else, and you all can deny I ever said this, but it probably was my favorite overseas assignment. It is a fascinating place, you know, pre-Islamic, <laughs> Islamic art deco period now. I mean, the history is just rich all the way through. Um, they, generally speaking, um, are a people who prize good senses of humor. So I did a lot of laughing while I was in Egypt talking about any number of topics. Um, people are very forthright when talking about political issues and, and quite happy to argue uh, enthusiastically. And all of those things fit my personality very well. So it was a great fit for me. I was the human rights officer, so three times now I've been the human rights officer, but as a junior officer, you can, if you like human rights and want to fight for it, you can specialize in it. We have a whole bureau for human rights. Or you can, like me, think, and eh, you kind of stuck with this job because human rights is very important and somebody else needs to really focus on it, not me. But um, human rights officer in all three of my first posts, um, Sometimes you can be the women's officer, the women's affairs officer. 
Uh, there are any number, as I said, jobs that the first tour, the entry level officers, you are going to do at least once or twice. So human rights was my three time job. But it was fascinating. When I arrived in Cairo, I think I got there on a Wednesday. And on Thursday, there was a huge riot at the um, cement factory in Helwan. Um, the police had been sent in, some people, demonstrators had been killed. Uh, my boss said, get to Helwan and find out what's going on. And I said, sir, yes, sir. And then I went back to my office and asked my colleague, where is Helwan? Because I had no idea. Uh, but get in the car and go. And because I had the language, use the language and talk to demonstrators. Why are you demonstrating? What's happening? What are your grievances? What do you expect from the government? What, what will you accept from the government? What will it take to get you back to work? What will it take to make you feel like you've been heard? All of those questions were important to understand. These are kind of frontline issues that younger diplomats deal with. You also have to go in and speak to people in the government or speak to people in civil society because I was dealing on internal issues. I was dealing with civil society, groups that were looking to broaden democratic participation in Egypt, groups that were looking for greater rights for religious Muslims. I was talking to the Muslim Brotherhood. It hadn't been designated as a terrorist organization by the U.S. at that point. Um, I was, my interlocutor was with the Human Rights Organization, Human Rights Organization of Egypt, and what's happening with people in prisons. It was voting free and fair? Um, those are things that the younger officers, the first, second, and third tour officers, are really focusing on getting ground truth in the country that helps inform the policies as we go up. Because as diplomats, your job is to help your host nation, the people in the host nation, understand US policy, why we do what we do, and hopefully get them to support it. Um, if not agree and support it, at least understand why we're doing what we're doing and understand that it comes from a place of trying to be part of the solution. We are not always part of the solution. I recognize that, you should recognize that. It's one of the reasons that we need your voices. Your generation looks at the world, I think in a more holistic way and a less black and white and confrontational way. And we need that. We need to rethink how we look at national security. We have to rethink, do we want to continue to be the world's largest purveyor of arms? Is that what we want to be doing in the world? Is there something better that the United States can be known for? Um, something different. And we've got a good reputation in many, many countries, but we've got a deserve not great reputation in other countries. So we can always do better. And rethinking national security is something you all can do for us. Again, I said at the beginning, you're needed. I say again, you're needed. So um, I evidently did a great job while I was in Egypt making my contacts with local Egyptians, um, interacting with them in their home, in my home. Um, because I found out close to the end of my two years, I got called up to the number two at the embassy, the deputy chief of mission, not the ambassador, but his deputy. And we went out on the embassy balcony. And he said to me, Gina, did you have a dinner party three weeks ago in your home? And I said, yes. And I'm thinking, oh, did I spend too much money on it? Or did I not invite the right people from the embassy or, you know, just trying to think, why is he asking me about my dinner party? And he said, okay, and did you invite so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? And, -so? and I said, yes, I did. And did you talk about X, Y, and Z? And I said, yes, thinking how in the world does he know? And he said, your house is bugged we have been told by one of our intel contacts that there are listening devices in your home so you need to be careful who you have there until you leave this post and i had another few months on my assignment and i was completely freaked out thinking okay what arguments did they hear with my husband where are these bugs oh my god and 
he said, we have to leave you in the apartment because we can't let them know we know. So you're going to have to stay. Just be careful. If you're going to argue with your husband, take it outside. Just be careful. Anyway, so I went home and told my husband, don't want to walk. Uh, in the neighborhood, and we managed to stick it out the last several months. And I remember running into an Egyptian diplomat years later, and he said, oh, yes, I used to get the reports on you once a week. You were very good. You knew everybody. We used to laugh over your reports. So I, I, I was doing a good job. The, the host nation recognized that by bugging my house. But that's one of those things you can talk a little bit more about in the Q&A period that may come up in your career.